Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. It's been a very long time since we've last had a chat, and some of you are wondering, did he die? Well, not yet. In fact, I'm still here, and I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to in the subsequent uh, three months or so. Now, before I went on this long hiatus, I was telling you about my adventures in gem cutting and how I was getting into it. I even showed you some of the stones that I was getting into. But the reason for my long interlude is I don't like to put rubbish content out there. So when faced between the option of showing something lousy that I'm likely to take down later, or just wait a little bit to release it into the world, I choose to wait. I know, call me Willy Wonka. But in this time, I've been working on my cutting skills. And so now I was noticing as I was looking around at some of the things that I've been making, I've now got a handsome pile of stones. And this is a nice thing to just have on your couch or in your pocket or on the kitchen table or well, pretty much everywhere. And I've noticed that it brings me great joy to look down and see all of these stones that I've cut glittering and smiling up at me. And there are basically three types of cuts that I've been working on while working through Justin K. Prim's Faceting Apprentice. If you haven't already checked out his website and you're curious about lapidary, please go over to facetingapprentice.com. Justin has put together a fantastic course with the three fundamental cuts that you really need to master in order to understand what faceting is about. So that's what I've been doing. I've been slamming my head against this, well, not this machine, because that would be dreadfully unpleasant, but I've been practicing, is probably a better way to say it, these three cuts so that I can get them to the level where I am satisfied and I can show this to anyone and say, yeah, I did that. You don't like it? You try it. And those three cuts are, first and foremost, the Round Brilliant. Now, I've deviated from the Round Brilliant at this point. I actually prefer another faceting pattern, which is also in Justin's book, that's a historical cut. This one's called the Brilliant Star. The reason I like it is the faceting pattern down on the pavilion side of the stone actually looks like a snowflake, and I think that's pretty cute. And also, as I'm the king of hipsters, when I see something too much, I want to deviate from it. We're bringing sexy back. So when I'm cutting a round stone, which is the first stone that everyone cuts, now I just go straight to the brilliant star because I like it. That's nice. The next fasting pattern you'll need to master if you want to get good with faceting is the step cut. And I have done a whole bunch of these because I really, really like the step cut. There's less facets than in the standard round brilliant, but there's a whole lot of sparkle. Technically, large step patterns are more to emphasize color, but I find them bold. So whether it's sparkly or bold, I don't really care, as long as there's a lot of action. You tell me there's no action in that. Believe me, not into temptation. Now, there are many different types of step cut patterns, but fundamentally, once you get to the bottom of the logic of how step cuts work and how to make them with this machine, they really follow the same logic. It's not hard. So after I mastered that, I decided to torture myself for a very long time on a personal favorite cut of mine, which is the cushion shape. Now, the cushion shape is more demanding because you have to freestyle the corners. And symmetry is not a strength of mine at all. And instead of there being a strong symmetry, what happens is even if you have a diagram for a cushion shape, depending on that radius of the corner, you're going to have to cheat and adjust these facets over on the shoulders. And that is complex. So the cushion, or an oval, but I don't like ovals, so I just do cushions, you end up, you end up doing things like this, taking copious amounts of notes of the adjustments that you made, because Lord knows I can't keep those in my head. What'd you just call me? And I'm sure everybody has their own little way of doing this. Perhaps I'll show you how I do it later on, but right now that's too technical and I don't have the heart for it. <laughs> but as I wrap up this little chat, what I want to say is that Finally, I am making a cushion that I am proud of, and that brings me great joy. But in order to get to that place of joy, you have to go through a certain amount of trial and tribulation. And what that was for me was realizing that, yes, you do have to own each pattern yourself. You don't have to make up the pattern entirely from scratch. You start with a basic outline, but it's kind of like getting to know a friend. Just because you've had friends before doesn't mean you know how to make friends with this person. You have to talk to them. You have to hang out. You have to learn their weird little quirks. And you have to learn to adapt to their weird little quirks. And that's what we do with cushions. And that's what you'd have to do with me if we ever, you know, meet each other. But at the end of the day, I think that's healthy. It's a wholesome thing. And once you do figure out, okay, this is what I need to do in order to conquer the cushion and get to know the cushion well, 
then you two will have incredible confidence in your skills because you earned it. You finally got to the top of that plateau. And you see at the top of that plateau that there is no room for rest because the rest of the mountain awaits that away. So if you've got any other questions, please head over to gemshepherd.com where you can get a hold of me directly. Otherwise, please leave a comment down below, hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, bye-bye.